Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In respiratory physiology we are currently considering diffusion of the gases across the respiratory membrane we considered oxygen diffusion in the previous lecture and in this lecture we will look at carbon dioxide diffusion across the lung. To review what we did in the previous lecture, we saw that oxygen transfer in the lung or what we call VO2 or oxygen consumption at the tissue level or oxygen uptake at the lung level, it is the same. VO2 is affected in these conditions listed here, hypoventilation. Remember the mnemonic that we have been using, HASH and VADE. V stands for ventilation impairment or hypoventilation, A for atmospheric hypoxia, D for diffusion impairment. Diffusion impairment occurs when there is a decrease in surface area of the respiratory membrane, increase in thickness or a condition called VQ mismatch, which we shall be seeing in greater detail in a later lecture. In addition to these conditions, oxygen transfer is also affected in anemia and cardiac failure. The S there represents cardiac failure and stands for stagnant hypoxia. In all these five conditions, oxygen consumption is affected, VO2 is reduced, that is what we call this tissue hypoxia. But arterial PO2 or partial pressure of dissolved oxygen in arterial blood is affected only in the first three conditions and we refer to that as arterial hypoxia. Arterial PO2 is not affected in anemia or cardiac output. In anemia, content of arterial oxygen is lower. In cardiac failure, even arterial oxygen content is normal, but what is impaired is the amount of oxygen taken up or delivered per minute because blood flow is slower in cardiac failure which is what we call this stagnant hypoxia. We will look at aspects of carbon dioxide diffusion and come back to the same framework and see what happens to carbon dioxide diffusion in each of these cases. What happens to VCO2 and what happens to arterial PCO2. That is how we will go about with regard to carbon dioxide diffusion. We have seen this cartoon before. Let us think of this as the alveolar compartment, this as the pulmonary capillary and that is the diffusion membrane which is shown here. This is the Fick's equation which tells us that flux of a gas across a membrane is equal to the difference in concentrations of the gas. Here we represent it as partial pressures. P1 here is the carbon dioxide concentration in the pulmonary capillary or systemic venous blood which comes into the pulmonary capillary through pulmonary artery, but we will call this PVCO2, the V there stands for venous carbon dioxide. So, that is 45 millimeter mercury and that is P1. P2 is at 40 millimeter mercury. We have seen earlier that the level of alveolar carbon dioxide is precisely maintained at this value by the level of ventilation. This value is important because this is the value which will be attained in the pulmonary arterial blood and that value is important to buffer bicarbonate that is there in arterial blood. So, this level of carbon dioxide is important to maintain the pH of arterial blood, not allowing it to become too alkaline because of the bicarbonate. We have seen this earlier. So, 45 millimeter mercury carbon dioxide is what comes into the capillary. In the alveolus, ventilation maintains alveolar carbon dioxide at 40 millimeter mercury. The pressure gradient is therefore just 5 millimeter mercury. We have seen that arterial carbon dioxide is equal to alveolar carbon dioxide in almost all clinical situations you will come across except extra pulmonary shunt. That is the only condition the arterial carbon dioxide will be higher than alveolar carbon dioxide. Otherwise, the two are equal and this is a very important concept in respiratory physiology. Why do we say that carbon dioxide transfer across the alveolar membrane is extremely efficient? 
Let us compare these values with those for oxygen. VO2 or flux of oxygen is 250 ml per minute in the resting conditions in a reference adult male and these are the different terms with which we refer to this number earlier. When it comes to flux of carbon dioxide, whatever carbon dioxide is found in the tissues is what is transferred from the capillary to the alveolus in the lungs. For every ml of oxygen consumed, 1 ml of carbon dioxide will be produced and therefore removed in the lungs if the respiratory quotient is 1. What do we mean by respiratory quotient? It is indeed the amount of carbon dioxide formed for every ml of oxygen. Respiratory quotient will be at 1 if an individual metabolizes a purely carbohydrate diet. But since normally our diet is a mixed diet composed of fats and proteins, a little less carbon dioxide is formed in the tissues for every ml of oxygen con uh, consumed. And we say the RQ is 0 0.8 because only 200 ml of carbon dioxide is produced in the tissues while 250 ml of oxygen is consumed every minute. And that 200 ml of carbon dioxide produced in the tissues is removed in the lungs and therefore the flux of carbon dioxide across the respiratory membrane would be that number as well. Here we are just assuming a respiratory quotient of 1 to keep things simple. But you must know that it is normally 0.8 and what we produce is 200 ml per minute in the resting conditions in a reference adult male. So, for that flux of oxygen, the partial pressure difference for oxygen is 60 millimeter mercury. Alveolar partial pressure is 100, venous partial pressure, systemic venous partial pressure is 40 and that is the gradient across which oxygen transfer occurs, 60 millimeter mercury. Molecular weight of oxygen is that and the root of molecular weight would be that number. Area, surface area of the respiratory membrane as high as 170 meter square for both lungs and the thickness of the respiratory membrane is about 0.5 microns. So, those are the numbers we use to calculate flux of oxygen. In comparison, the difference in partial pressures for carbon dioxide is just 5 millimeter mercury. Area and thickness would be the same as for oxygen. When you consider root of molecular weight, it is in fact higher than oxygen. In spite of this, in spite of such a smaller number here, how is carbon dioxide flux equal to oxygen flux? We have to understand therefore that the solubility of carbon dioxide in the respiratory membrane must be very high. In fact, it is so high that even if there are changes in A or T, carbon dioxide flux is not affected. For example, let us take a one lung situation where the other lung has been resected. In that situation, surface area for transport of gases is reduced. Oxygen flux will be reduced by half, but carbon dioxide flux will not be affected. That is important to understand. You also have to keep in mind that when VO2 reduces, VCO2 will reduce comparably and that is why VCO2 will be low. But if there was a way of maintaining VCO2 a constant, even though VO2 is less. For the sake of discussion, if VCO2 was normal, all that is found in the tissues will be eliminated in the lungs, even though there is impairment of diffusion membrane, because the solubility of carbon dioxide is very, very high. This is an important lesson to learn. So, that is about diffusion impairment that is the extreme example that we considered is one lung situation where the surface area of the diffusion membrane is reduced by half. Even in that condition in the one lung if ventilation has increased to maintain alveolar carbon dioxide at 40 millimeter mercury, the Venous carbon dioxide can be 45 millimeters mercury, 
and effective transfer of whatever carbon dioxide is found in the tissues will occur. So, that arterial carbon dioxide is kept at 40 millimeter mercury. What I want to impress upon you is that even if there is decrease in surface area or increase in thickness of the respiratory membrane, as long as ventilation is not affected, not only is VCO2 not affected, even PaCO2 is not affected. You would not even have hypercarbia. However, if there is ventilation impairment, that is what we saw in lecture 6, I think, where we considered carbon dioxide transport. In ventilation impairment, VCO2 will not reduce. We saw that with the ink experiment, but arterial carbon dioxide would have increased because alveolar carbon dioxide would have increased. When there is ventilation impairment, the amount of carbon dioxide that goes out is the same or the amount of carbon dioxide that crosses the diffusion membrane is the same and therefore, all the VCO2 formed in the tissues will be eliminated, but the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the air that you breathe out in the alveolus and therefore, the artery will be higher than normal. That is what we considered in lecture 6 that in hypoventilation you will have hypercarbia or type 2 respiratory failure. In ventilation impairment PaCO2 would increase, but in diffusion impairment arterial PCO2 will be normal. Let us consider what we have just said in terms of this mnemonic. Carbon dioxide transfer in the lungs is not affected. That is whatever amount of carbon dioxide is formed in the tissues will be eliminated in the lungs whether there is hypoventilation or diffusion impairment or anemia or cardiac failure. In this condition, however, there will be hypercarbia that is arterial PCO2 would have gone up, but in these conditions arterial PCO2 will be normal. That is why we refer to the gas profile in diffusion impairment as type 1 respiratory failure and in hypoventilation as type 2 respiratory failure where both gases are affected. That is there is hypoxia and hypercarbia here. In addition to ventilation impairment, we consider three other situations where there can be hypercarbia, atmospheric hypercarbia, malignant hypothermia and metabolic alkalosis. So, in summary, ventilation impairment is the major cause of hypercarbia in arterial blood. Diffusion impairment does not affect either amount of carbon dioxide that has to move out or arterial PCO2. Though the standard teaching is that diffusion membrane problems do not lead to hypercarbia because the solubility of carbon dioxide across the respiratory membrane is very high. There are some research groups, especially the one led by Professor Thomas de Courcy, which questions this concept of carbon dioxide diffusion. Professor de Courcy questions whether the diffusion coefficient for carbon dioxide is so high or its solubility is so high that that alone can account for the massive rates of transfer of carbon dioxide across the respiratory membrane from blood to the alveolus. He says that probably are special modes of transport of carbon dioxide across the alveolar epithelium. He finds that there is a very high density of proton channels on the alveolar epithelium next only to neutrophils in density. There is no role assigned to the proton channels on the alveolar epithelium. Professor de Courcy asks if they assist in carbon dioxide elimination in the lung. That is a question for you to ponder and read more about if you are interested. Thank you for your attention.